there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Hi, I'm Mark Ingalls. New Zealanders have an incredible history of first ascents on Everest, starting, of course, with Sir Edmund Hillary. I'm a mountaineer, so I remember when, in 1988, Lydia Brady summited Everest. I remember because Lydia was the first woman to ascend Everest without oxygen. Now, some have disputed her solo climb. There have been numerous investigations over the last 20 years. But why don't we let Lydia tell her story of how to fight to get to the top. It was only when I got uh, maybe 50 or 80 metres below the south summit of Everest that I suddenly realised that I was going to be able to stay alive for sure. And I was like, yes, I've climbed Everest. I grew up in Christchurch with my mother, and she was a solo mother in the days before DPB. And my mother and I didn't have a lot of money. So we lived in a one bedroom flat. And until I was 11 years old, I shared a bedroom with my mother. I was pretty good academically. So at primary school, I got lots and lots of A's academically. Then it would get to phys ed. And I was always super, super bad at sports. Sports was terrifying for me, and I would get nauseous, I would actually end up being sick with stress about sports days. And my mother obviously wanted to get me outside and doing something and give me confidence. So she sent me to a, an outdoor instruction course. And near the end, we were doing some abseiling. It was probably about three metres. And Paddy Freeney stopped us all. And he said, you know, some of you some of you guys will go on to be trampers. Now, I figured out what a tramper was. And, and then he goes, and occasionally one or two of you will go on to become a climber. And he said it like that. He goes, a climber. And I go, oh, I don't know what a climber is, but sounds so good. I want to be a climber. L Lydia joined the tramping club as a young girl. She was only 14 and she had to get special permission to join the club. Lydia came along, this young, enthusiastic kid, really enthusiastic. She uh, just wanted to experience everything and know everything. When I was 17, I went and climbed Mount Aspiring with Margaret. And the night before I climbed Mount Aspiring, I had a dream that I've never forgotten. And I was looking down the Aspiring Valley, the west coast side of the Aspiring Valley, and coming up the Aspiring Valley, there were these angels singing hallelujah. <laughs> we went up a route called the ramp and uh, with a rope on all the time. And Lydia's busy saying, why do we need a rope? Lots of people climb without ropes. I said, no, we don't. We climb with a rope, Lydia. She belayed me all the way up the steep snow and ice. And apparently the whole time I was going, why do I need a rope? Why do I need a rope? But it's steep and if I'd fallen off, I would have died, of course. So she looked after me. And Margaret didn't need a rope, but I did. When we reached the summit, she was so delighted to be at the top that she lay on her stomach, drumming her feet on the mountains, looking down the steep face route and saying, yay, my first 3,000 metre peak. If you look at Lydia in many ways, she's got all the qualities of a perfect mountaineer, particularly a high altitude mountaineer. She's lean, she's a bit lanky, she's also very determined, which is the other. It's almost a obsessive determination. 
The golden era of Himalayan climbing was really in the 50s to the end of the 80s. And why I call this the golden era is because people going climbing in the Himalayas were climbing for themselves. And pretty much, if you went to the Himalayas in the olden days, I call it, then uh, you were always doing a first. It was pretty easy as a female going to the Himalayas to start looking at doing firsts. So by 1988, I'd already been on uh, five Himalayan expeditions and two to some of the highest mountains in the world. She's always been very good at altitude. Um, high altitude hasn't affected her as much as it affects some people, so she's always been very strong at high altitude levels, and this is one of her great strengths, of course. She clearly has very good oxygen uptake. Um, I mean, it's a complicated business, the business of how big your lungs are and how much oxygen you can get in and how you can get the oxygen to the muscles. They're the important things. And Lydia's got all of those things. In 88, I had the opportunity to go to Mount Everest. So the members on the expedition were me, of course, Rob Hall, Gary Ball, and a guy called Bill Atkinson. I'd known Rob since I was 15, and we both grew up in Christchurch and went mountaineering, and he was in the mountaineering scene, and so that was kind of old friend, if you like. And Gary, I only knew a little bit, and uh, he was a mountain guide. And uh, Bill, I knew as uh, Rob's friend. And although you have your own tiny four-person team, you also have the greater teams, the people that you are working with on the mountain. I got on extremely well with the Slovaks on Everest, and we were a joint expedition on Everest. So the, the whole eight people go up to do Mount Everest. Four of them are Slovaks, they go up to do the southwest face of Everest, and four of them are New Zealanders to go up to do the South Pillar without a permit. We were always going to apply for the permit retrospectively, and we had no problem with paying for the permit. And this actually wasn't that unusual in these days. They were being a little bit naughty, but... If you look at it from the Nepalese authorities' point of view, they just wanted the revenue. Actually, they wanted a little bit of control over what people were doing. But the main issue was they wanted the money. So we all went up to Camp 2, 6,500 metres, underneath the southwest face of Mount Everest. We were waiting there, and the next day this big storm came in. And it stormed and stormed and stormed, and then by the next day I go, in my head, I go, right, I'm not going to be strong enough to stay here. It's 6,500 metres, melting my own snow, cooking my own food. We don't even have enough food. I'm going to go down to base camp again. And I found out that the Slovaks had also made the same decision to go down. And then I went to see the New Zealanders. And the New Zealanders went, no, nah, we're going to stay. And we had an argument, and they said, if you go down, then we will be one day ahead of you when the weather clears, and so you'll have to climb Mount Everest on your own. And I said, I know. After I went to base camp, the storm was a five-day storm. I had my birthday, my 27th birthday at base camp, and uh, had a little party, but not much, because we were going for the summit, and prepared and got organised, and then the weather cleared and we went back up to Camp 2 to arrive, and the New Zealanders had just left to climb the South Pillar. So I was at Camp 2, having got there from base camp that day, and they came down from trying the South Pillar and saying, we're tired, we couldn't summit, we're going home. So they said, you'll have to climb Everest on your own. And I said, well, OK, I will. <laughs> I had it planned, actually, obviously. <laughs> I had five days to plan it. In any game, really, as soon as you step outside the circle, the understood ground, you leave yourself open for criticism from the people who think they are the establishment. Unfortunately, in Lydia's case, 
it was a male-dominated activity which occasionally threw up good female performers. But um, I think the males thought, well, we couldn't do it, so how could a woman possibly do it? The next day, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I left Camp 2, 6,500 metres, to go to Camp 3, 7,300 metres. I knew that I had to get from Camp 2 to the South Coal by midday because otherwise I would not have enough time to rest and melt water, to drink, to rejuvenate, to become strong in order to leave that night to go and climb to the summit. So I had a great sleep on the South Coal without oxygen and then also there was a Spanish expedition on the South Coal and they were leaving to climb and they were leaving and they were using oxygen. So we left about two o'clock in the morning to climb Everest from the South Coal and we climbed up a slope and the Spanish team was in front of me and they drew away slowly because they were on oxygen and they could go faster. So then I start to follow up and I can see the Spanish ahead and then they disappear over the south summit. And I'm on the south summit of Mount Everest, 100 vertical metres away from the main summit, I meet the Spanish coming down. So comparatively, they have taken only a little bit longer than me. They are really stressed. They've got one member with frostbite and one member with some cerebral edema. Immediately, the Spanish pick up their radio and radio to base camp what is going on, of course, for them with their sick person and their frostbite person, and also that they've met me and that I'm saying that I'm going to go on to the main summit. When the Spanish radioed from the south summit down to base camp and the Kiwis went along to hear that I was on the south summit going for the main summit, when they heard that, I think they were already packed up and they picked up their packs and left base camp to walk out to Kathmandu. So I was on the south summit of Everest. From there, it was really lucky because the snow was quite deep and the Sherpas and the Spanish had made big steps in the snow. So I had a staircase to climb to the summit of Everest. And that was the only reason I'm sure I made it that day, you know, because I had these steps and I could just go one, two, three. And you go up and along a bit, and then you get to this section where you've got to climb what's called the Hillary Step. And that's pretty steep. You know, you've got one foot there and one foot there and then one foot there and one foot there. And you can look down and you look down the, east, the Kenshong face of Everest, you know, it's like, whoa. <laughs> But it's OK. And there was a little rope there, and I don't know what it was tied to. I just held onto it with my hand, you know. It wouldn't stop me, really. And I'm a New Zealand mountaineer. And New Zealand mountains are like mini Himalayan mountains. And so we have bad snow and steep drops and, you know, steep little steps and things like that. So we're used to that kind of climbing. It's good old New Zealand climbing. <laughs> It took a long time, of course, to go from the south summit to the main summit. And the whole time I was really aware that I didn't know if I could get down, but I thought I could, and then I thought I could, and then I thought I could, you know, that's how it went. And I, when I got to the main summit, people say, and were you elated? And were you excited? And I was exhausted. <laughs> When I got to the top of Mount Everest, I sat down and I was really tired. And my guess is that I sat down for 15 minutes. But remember, I knew I was going to survive only if I got going again. So for me, the most important thing was to get there, to tag it, to look around, and then to get going again, because I was burning with curiosity. Can I do it? Oh, I was totally petrified. I was completely scared about not getting down. Climbing at altitude is super unusual because going up is really, really hard work and going down is really easy. So I knew that. I'd had the experience of climbing 8,000 metres. I knew going down was going to be easy, relatively. At about 8,650, I was able to just relax and know that I could get down. 
And two things happened. Well, of course, one, I could go, yes, I've climbed Mount Everest. But the second thing was this joy of the years that I'd put in, in New Zealand, of going, I sex, step, step, I sex, step, step, that got me down from the summit of Mount Everest to the South Col. When I got back down to base camp, I learned that the winds had become really strong and things had gotten quite serious up on Mount Everest for the Czechoslovakians. We had radio contact with the Czechoslovakians until 5.30 and then they were, began to lose each other and then we lost radio contact with them. So it was my time at base camp, my arrival at base camp was a mixture of joy and a mixture of extreme sadness. The team's reunion with family and friends in Christchurch ended an expedition dogged with controversy and disaster. The four Czechoslovakian members of the team were caught by savage conditions on Mount Everest and vanished. In earlier bad weather, the New Zealanders decided to retreat, but Lydia Brady defied team discipline, setting out on a solo climb for the summit on a route forbidden by the Nepalese authorities. When she returned to the team claiming success, she was not believed. Uh, you have to realise that uh, at 8,000 metres above sea level without bottled oxygen, just funny things happen to the, the brain sometimes. Once I got to Kathmandu, I was visited pretty quickly by our liaison officer who showed me the letter that Rob Hall and Gary Ball wrote and signed that they'd said that they didn't believe that I climbed Mount Everest. Why? Why would you do that to somebody? My immediate thoughts when I saw the letter was disbelief. I just felt that obviously something, some big mechanism was going on that I couldn't stop, but I had to do something about. But I also knew that I probably didn't have the skill to do that much about it. In the past, Nepal has banned climbing teams that didn't obey the rules. The New Zealand team has asked authorities there to consider Lydia Brady's controversial climb the action of one individual. If you climb a route without a permit in Nepal, you generally get a ban for five, but mostly 10 years. I didn't want to get banned for 10 years, and that was my goal. My goal was to keep climbing. So I said that I was on the wrong route because I was taking photographs and I went too high. And I never said I didn't summit. It was possibly the wrong thing to do, but I didn't know what else to do if I wanted to avoid being banned. I heard it over the media, and my first concern was to speak to Lydia. Uh, so um, I found when I knew she was back in Kathmandu, I, I phoned her in Kathmandu to, to talk to her and, and support her. At this point in Kathmandu, the phones are ringing all the time. The landlines, remember. Graham Dingle, who I didn't know, was offering his support and I really wish I'd taken it and he'd been there to help me. Margaret Clark would have come over to help me out. And so there was lots of people who were just going, what's going on? But I was essentially completely alone. Christchurch climber Lydia Brady arrived home today. It was hoped she'd be able to shed some light on her claim to being the first woman to conquer Mount Everest without oxygen. But she refused to discuss the matter, and a news conference conducted by the manager of the expedition only helped to confuse the story. The height Lydia reached is uncertain, and there is some doubt that this high point was indeed the summit of Mount Everest. There's a code amongst mountaineers that no matter how close you get to the summit of a mountain, if you don't actually climb it, you don't claim you've climbed it. There's no point in claiming you've done something when you haven't done it. Mountaineering is what Lydia Brady lives for, and she was relieved to learn she had only been banned for three years by the Nepalese authorities, and not ten. But Lydia stands by her claim to be the first woman in the world to reach the Everest summit without oxygen. People can choose to believe me or not to believe me. As far as I'm concerned, I summited. If I had been hallucinating, I would not have come back, because my judgments would have been such that I wouldn't have been able to make it down.
I had no doubt from the beginning that she had summited because I simply put the facts together. The time she reached the South Summit, the time that she still had to reach the main summit, knowing her determination, the fact that the Spanish had got there when they weren't in particularly good condition, everything added up to her being successful. After Everest, there were two big investigations done by a guy called Richard Cowper, who's a journalist for the Financial Times. And uh, one of the other ones was a Spanish journalist who I didn't really know anything about, but he was a climbing historian and he did lots and lots of research because I think that he was really interested in my story. I think part of it is that we're um, a curious nation with an inferiority complex and we often have the answers here but we don't believe them. So we look to overseas and when people like Christian Bonington and Doug Scott said, we think she made it, then people started to believe it. Three years ago, New Zealander Lydia Brady claimed she scaled Mount Everest without oxygen. At the time, there was considerable disbelief, much of it from some of our top mountaineers. But today, the president of the New Zealand Alpine Club called for Lydia's feat to be officially sanctioned. The change that's now come through makes it very, very easy to accept that, this, that Lydia, in this case, is more than likely to have climbed Everest, and there is no, no grounds for any doubt at this point. Lydia hasn't been celebrated the way she should have been. If you look at our history in high altitude mountaineering, it was Ed Hillary first on the summit of Everest. It was Norm Hardy first on the summit of Kanchenjunga. Lydia Brady first on the summit of Everest without oxygen. It seems that everyone accepts that I climbed Everest without oxygen. And because I've been there, I'm happy that I climbed Everest without oxygen. And it, but it is very nice to be uh, appreciated that your climb did exist. It is important on a personal level, but it's not the reason why I climb 